Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast and keynote presentation, Evolving Paradigms of Pharmaco, MPE, Molecular Pathological Epidemiology and Immuno-MPE for Precision Medicine, presented by Dr. Suji Ogino, a professor at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School, and Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. He's also the founding chief of program in molecular pathological epidemiology at Brigham and Women's Hospital and an associate member of Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. I am Dr. Susie Valdez of Labroots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labroots. Labroots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type those questions into the drop-down box that appear on the screen. Dr. Ogino will be responding to all of your questions via email. If you have any trouble hearing or seeing the presentation, please click on the help desk button located on the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen or use that ask a question box and let us know you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and that offers continuing education credits. Click on the continuing education credit tab located at the top right corner of your presentation window and follow the process for obtaining those credits. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming our keynote presenter, Dr. Suji Ogino. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Welcome, sir. Hello, thank you very much uh, for watching and listening to my lecture entitled Evolving Paradigms of Pharmaco MPE, Molecular Pathological Epidemiology, and the Immuno MPE for Precision Medicine. Uh, I'm a patho uh, Shuji Ogino, Chief of Program in MPE at the Brigham Women's Hospital and Professor of Pathology and Epidemiology of uh, Brigham Women's Hospital, Dana Farber Cancer Institute, Harvard Medical School, and Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and also Associate Member of Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard, which wasn't listed here. So, by, uh, so uh, so today's talk, I have three abbreviations I often use, so I illustrate here. One is uh, CRC, standing for colorectal cancer, and uh, MPE for molecular pathological epidemiology, and uh, MSI for microsatellite instability. And by the way, this MSI is an uh, uh, indicator of a hypermutator status of many uh, tumor type with many new neo antigens and FDA approved last year use of immune checkpoint inhibitor pembrolizumab for MSI high solid tumors across body site. So this is a very important biomarker now. So now uh, I just talk about uh, briefly introduce molecular pathological epidemiology MPE. As the name stands for, this is a merge of molecular pathology and epidemiology. And this is not just a merge of names. It's the merge of integration of method, which is critical in this field. And I think this is, uh, it's, you know, it is clear that this MPE is you know, also equal to big data, pathobiological, population science, and then uh, uh, it can help drug development. That's I would like to illustrate in this lecture. And then I would like to also uh, announce that we will have a fourth, now already fourth international molecular pathological epidemiology meeting uh, in Boston, USA in, in from March 31st to June 1st. And this is a free meeting uh, open for international community. So please uh, register and on also submit the abstract too if you're interested. And then this uh, mp.org, mpmeeting.org is a meeting site you can actually uh, go. 
So, uh, so why? Probably you never heard of uh, pharmaco MP as well as immuno MP. So I would like to illustrate why this appro these approaches are useful. And uh, here I just uh, illustrate uh, complex biological systems. Uh, so here is a tumor. I illustrate the tumor cells and the immune cells, but obviously there are other stromal cell types uh, not not uh, uh, not demonstrated here for the sake of simplicity, but nonetheless, tumor cells and immune cells have a very very complex uh, interactions with each other, and also the tumor cell and immune cell uh, interact with each other as well. And then, uh, oh, oh, but uh, we frequently uh, e e examine these interactions and possibly with maybe uh, drugs or genetic variation. Now also microbiota, but uh, also other exposures such as uh, diet, nutrients, obesity, for example, environmental exposures such as smoking and other uh, air pollution, for example. Those uh, have been known to influence um, microenvironment, but those are not studied in current immunology research, which uh, I, have, I, I was uh, interested in going in uh, actually several years ago. Uh, so that's why uh, these concepts are first actually conceptualized in 2011. And so the, uh, because it is a big challenge to recapitulate, these complex interactions in experimental models. And so let's get the data from human population, human tissue, human tumors. That's our goal. And also uh, new drugs always need to be tested in humans. So uh, even, even drug working model systems perfectly, it may not work in real human. Uh, tissue, um, hu human body, so we have to really test it uh, using a human specimens, human tissue. And another, another interesting thing we have known for many years now <laughs> is the exposures. I just put uh, diet, obesity, and the environment, genetic variation, microbiota, and drug, but those those can easily influence the tumor microenvironment, including immune cell. So, uh, so traditional or type of uh, molecular pathological or epidemiology, we pretty much focus on tumor cell molecular pathology, but now we really need to consider immune cells and tumor cells together to, have, to gain more insights into pathogenesis and the role of uh, exposure variables. So one study uh, we, we conducted in collaboration with uh, Dr. Golub at the Broad Institute years ago uh, is here. So exposure and stroma can change the tumor phenotype. <laughs> so basically, uh, uh, melanoma with the BRAF mutation uh, are sensitive to RAF inhibitor, but if we continue to use RAF inhibitor, then uh, melanoma cells develop resistance. And how they develop resistance is the actually the stromal cell secrete HGF, hepatocyte growth factor. And then uh, that, that this growth factor confers resistance uh, of a melanoma cell against the RAF inhibitor. So, Actually, tumor cell and stromal cell work together, uh, and then I exposures such as a drug can actually modify phenotype, tumor stromal interaction. So this is a very uh, important concept. So, uh, so this question still uh, here, but anyway, I think it is important to consider exposures and tumor cells and immune cells all together, and then drugs. So that's why pharmaco MP why, uh, and also immuno MP are important approach. 
Here is some example. Uh, I put some uh, exposures which have been known to influence cancer risk, especially I'm, in, I'm uh, analyzing colorectal cancer. But exposures influence um, both cancer risks and immunity. So one example is aspirin. Aspirin uh, has been known to reduce cancer risk, but also moderate inflammation and immune re immunity. And so as a genetic variation, uh, here is omega-3 fatty acids uh, rich in fish oil and vitamin D, which uh, produced by uh, some uh, food and also uh, sun exposure and physical activity. Can, you know, this has been known to boost the immune system. And smoking uh, is considered to suppress the immune uh, response, etc. And then uh, every, all these exposures we looked, it seems they influence cancer risk differentially by uh, immune response status. Then I, I will show you data, some of them. However, immuno-MP studies are still very rare, and we need to do more immuno-MP studies. So here, uh, I think just a very, very uh, simple picture. Uh, it's really oversimplification, oversimplification of a tumor and the immune response relationship. But nonetheless, I just go over uh, here, but the tumor cell have a mutation in some genes and which give rise to um, uh, mutated peptide. Some of them will become new antigens to be presented to immune system. And then uh, immune response happened to against tumor cell. And then now tumor cell develop counter suppressive mechanisms such as upregulation of immune checkpoints to suppress immune response. So for example, a well-known example is the CD274 or PDL1 expression uh, that can suppress immune response and tumor cells survive. And we have shown that this, uh, within colorectal cancer, the CD274 expression, PDL1 expression, is inversely associated with the contents of a uh, FOXP3. Treg, regulatory T cell in uh, tumor tissue. So this is really a mutually exclusive mechanism of uh, immunosuppression. And then there are other methods to interrogate uh, immune, immune response status in tumor. Uh, but anyway, in epidemiologic studies, uh, most commonly used immune variable is perhaps a germline variation so far, for example, uh, HLA loci. And then also the blood markers are commonly used, such as CRP and IL-6. And then immune cells in the tumor microenvironment, that's I, uh, we, this is the main topic of today's lecture. And here I illustrated uh, HNE staining of the colon cancer tissue with abundant immune cell in the stroma, as well as uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes on top of tumor cell. So those are strong prognostic factor, and uh, we have shown, I mean, actually this is uh, not a published data. We have published a small subset of uh, our cohort uh, many years ago, but this is uh, based on more than 1,400 cases of colon rectal cancer. We clearly see a uh, nice prognostic value of uh, immune response, which is better than any other molecular marker. Actually, these are the very low immune responders and then high immune responders, virtually no uh, mortality <laughs> within the three plus uh, high-level immune responder. So uh, I just like to now illustrate a molecular pathological epidemiology database, and then we show I, I, I will show actual pharmaco-MP and the immuno-MP data. 
So I, I have been working on these two cohort studies uh, obviously, I haven't uh, started working at Harvard uh, from uh, in 1976, but uh, uh, the, this started more than 40 years ago, and then I joined uh, Harvard in 2001 to get involved in this cohort study. Uh, this cohort study is, uh, uh, you know, co gathered 120,000 women and followed more than 40 years or more and we have a lot of data of exposures and diseases. And then, uh, so the 1986 health professionals follow-up study started with uh, 50,000 men, and then the good uh, value of these cohort studies, uh, the fact that uh, they, uh, the fo participants were followed every two years by questionnaire how they eat, how they exercise, how they expose to smoking, alcohol, and then we collect the biospecimens too. So basically these cohort studies, uh, you know, more than 100,000 men and women, we collect the diet data, lifestyle, environment, and then we get the biospecimens like a blood to get the genetic data as well as plasma biomarkers and now uh, even metabolomics data. So during a follow-up of 40 or 30 years, obviously some of them develop cancer and then my interest is analyzing colorectal cancer and polyps in these cohort studies. And actually I, I received uh, NCI R35 Outstanding Investigator Award, which is a seven-year uh, major grant, and you know to c carry this job, and this uh, you know these analysis are actually a theme one in this uh, R35 award. So in this, uh, in, so I my task is analyzing molecular pathology of tumor, in, including whole exome sequencing now. And also we are analyzing tissue microbiota as well as immune response. And then we will assess uh, mortality of uh, patients or recurrence you know, uh, of uh, polyps. And then we get a very uh, unique finding in the pathogenesis of uh, colorectal cancer. So here is the data uh, from new antigen load analysis from whole exome sequencing of a thousand tumors. Uh, so the new antigen uh, is, uh, uh, is, is a neo so also called a neopeptide. So we calculate the you know, mutated peptide, which can bind to high affinity to HLA molecule. So we have a germline uh, whole exome data too. So we can actually estimate how many, how many neopeptides actually uh, bind to HLA molecule to be presented. So then it, predicts, uh, it may predict the response to immunotherapy, so it can be a biomarker in immunotherapy field. So we clearly show that uh, high neoantigen load, uh, they have a better outcome compared to uh, low neoantigen load. This is published in cell report paper. Also in, in this cell report paper, uh, we published that uh, association between number of neoantigens on the y-axis in a log scale, and then a lymphocytic reaction which calculated based on uh, histopathologic uh, evaluation, which uh, highly correlated uh, uh, both. So the, so the tumor has more neoantigens and they have more immune, immune reaction, lymphocytic reaction. However, there are overlaps, and then some of the uh, high lymphocytic reaction tumor, they have relatively lower new antigens, and some of the uh, low lymphocytic reaction tumor can have a higher new antigen too, and we like to know uh, why. Right now, we are analyzing. Also in the cell reports paper, we, uh, we analyzed the number of uh, genes 
of uh, antigen presenting machinery, uh, antigen, sorry, antigen processing machinery, and uh, we found a number of interesting findings. So, so these numbers indicate uh, percent mutated in immune low tumors on the left and then immune high tumor on the right. So you can see the higher percent of mutations observed for immune high tumor for a number of uh, machinery protein like uh, HLA-1, CANCS, and B2M, and so forth, other antigen-presenting machinery mutations are more common in immune-rich tumor. And we consider this can be a uh, uh, you know, adaptive mechanism of a tumor, uh, you know, they don't, they tend not to present a new antigen so that they can avoid uh, immune attack. So now uh, I would like to illustrate real uh, molecular pathological epidemiology analysis. So here is a basic scheme. So we have 170,000 participants, persons, with normal colon when they started the follow-up. And then some of them develop colorectal cancer with a very variable follow-up time. But we have about 1,600 colorectal cancer cases with the tissue available. We can look into immune response status. So we can subtype based on immune response status, and then we can actually uh, link specific exposure such as aspirin or omega-3 fatty acid to a specific immune subtype. That's a major uh, strength of this analysis. And also we can actually focus on the colorectal cancer cases and then uh, we have an immune subtype data, and then we like to know what kind of exposure influence which subtype, which immune subtype of uh, cancer. And this information can be used for uh, uh, adjuvant uh, treatment, for example, aspirin treatment. Maybe useful for one subtype or the other. We can have a predictive biomarker of immune status. So for example, uh, already, this is published six years ago, in the New England Journal of Medicine, we published paper that aspirin uh, has been known to reduce cancer mortality, but particularly a PIK3CA mutated subtype of tumor, but not the PIK3CA wild type tumor. And here is a uh, raw data. Um, so pix 3 mutant subgroup, we can see a substantial difference between aspirin user and non-user. Uh, this is a probability of death. So usually survival analysis curve is uh, flipped, but this uh, aspirin user have a lower mortality compared to non-user. However, the pix 3 wild type group uh, there's a, there was no difference whatsoever between a non-user and aspirin user. So this is a quite interesting. And we actually conducted in vitro study uh, comparing a PIX3CA uh, wild type cell lines and then PIX3CA mutant cell lines. They have a variable other genotype, but uh, we try to get as many as possible. <laughs> and then, uh, interestingly, pix 3 mutant subtype seem to be more sensitive to aspirin compared to pix 3 wild type uh, cell lines. So this uh, actually uh, back up our, our observational MP study uh, published in OncoTarget. And actually similar data published in this cancer prevention research uh, from uh, AJ Goyle group in Texas. And also uh, there, there is a similar data in breast cancer cell line studies as well. <coughs> 
And then uh, we are also, we, uh, so the pixel ECA is great to uh, predict uh, responders. However, we also interested in immune, immune marker interaction with uh, aspirin. So one marker we are interested in is this CD274 PDA1 expression. And then we hypothesize that if this mute uh, checkpoint activated, it could be uh, lower sensitivity to aspirin. So when we look at our data, it, it's true that uh, in the P, P, CD274 or PDL1 high subtype, which is supposed to be immune checkpoint activated, the aspirin do, uh, is not associated with survival. However, this CD274 PDA1 low subtype uh, regular use of aspirin uh, is, is associated with much better outcome compared to non-user. Uh, so this, this difference is very significant. So, and then this also uh, differential association seem to be in, independent of uh, pixel ECA uh, subtype. Actually, uh, pixel ECA wild type, you can use this CD274 expression to further separate responders. And pixel ECA mutants are actually, they respond so well, so we don't have enough uh, uh, mortality data to uh, be robust, but at least the pixel ECA wild type this CD274 can be another uh, sep uh, predictive marker to separate responders and non-responders. So uh, our data suggests that uh, if this CD274 expression is high, then uh, they, you know, the, as they, the, the tumor is resistant to aspirin, and, but this checkpoint is not activated, then they respond to aspirin, which is quite interesting. And then our, our question is now, uh, how, uh, how about this checkpoint inhibitor uh, with a combined with aspirin? And then that's the still open question. And I think uh, we hope to see if this combination therapy works. So now uh, we're going into uh, cancer incidence side of analysis. So we are interested in uh, preventing cancer because if we prevent cancer, we don't need to worry about uh, treatment or side effect or surgery. So uh, w our, our, our data is very, very precious because we, we have been following 170,000 individuals and we have outcome data with the immune response. And then we have all the exposure data collected before cancer diagnosis. So it, these exposure data are free from bias from cancer diagnosis. So uh, one good example is we published more than 10 years ago in New England Journal of Medicine. So we look at incidence of cancer classified by this enzyme PTGS2 status, uh, or another name is a cyclooxygenase 2 or COX2, which is a, the major target of aspirin. So we actually nicely show that aspirin is associated with lower risk for this PTGS2 high subtype, but not the PDGS2 low subtype. It, this makes uh, total sense. However, uh, however, we published 2007, after more than 10 years, still no follow-up paper whatsoever because <laughs> these data, as I mentioned, is hard to come up with. We have 170,000 people followed uh, 30 or 40 years. I mean, this 2007 period, it's a 20 or 30 years of follow-up still. And then we collect the tissue. We have uh, PTGS to expression data. So uh, this is a very, very precious data set. But nonetheless, 
uh, we don't have any follow-up data, so we hope that, you know, I, I think the international research community will come up with big population-based data set to validate uh, findings such as this. So now uh, I, I talk about the drugs and immune, immune tumorous interactions, but now we uh, just switch gear to microbiota because this is a very hot topic too. So we have been interested in uh, microbiota for more than five years now. In particular species we are interested in is uh, Fusobacterium nucleatum in tumor tissue. This uh, uh, have been sh shown to be a likely a C a colorectal cancer pathogen. And then um, lots of many studies now show that this uh, Fusobacterium nucleatum positive tumor, it, it has a lower immune response. And the experimental data suggest the uh, immunosuppressive property of a Fusobacterium nucleatum and also associated, uh, these positive cases are also associated with the higher stage and then shorter survival. So, so obviously our interest is that how gut microbiota uh, affects the cancer risk and the outcome. And then probably gut microbiota is influenced by diet because diet goes to colon, I mean, and then they, they use, uh, the bacteria can use uh, the nutrients and so forth. So um, first up hypothesis we made is the vegetables and whole grains and beans and fiber rich diet, which uh, show up as a prudent diet pattern we call. These are the dietary patterns. Um, by a factor analysis of a bunch of uh, food items. And this, this prudent diet can be associated with, uh, I think, the growth of uh, good bacteria and suppression of bad bacteria in gut, and then suppression of colorectal cancer, in particular this Fusobacterium nucleatum positive type. So that's our hypothesis to test. So uh, this is the real data we, we already published last year, JAMA Oncology. So here is a Fusobacterium nucleatum positive cancer risk according to a prudent diet score. So basically, a low indicates lower prudent diet score, low dietary fiber basically. And the high prudent diet score is rich in vegetable, gra whole grains, and beans and rich in fiber. So basically, uh, these prudent diet uh, is associated with a lower risk for Fusobacterium nucleatum positive cancer, a significant reduction of risk. However, Fusobacterium negative cancer, uh, there's no risk reduction whatsoever. And then the difference was uh, uh, also statistically significant too. So we, based on these data, we speculate this prudent diet rich in fiber uh, is associated with lower risk and suppressing the development of Fusobacterium nucleatum positive cancer and not, uh, not influencing uh, Fusobacterium nucleatum negative cancer type. So I, this uh, classification based on tissue microbiota can be very, very informative in a molecular pathological epidemiology. So uh, modifying microbiota can be uh, CRC pre prevention strategies. So for example, uh, this is a good example of this, uh, I mean, prudent diet, rich in vegetables, whole grains, beans, and dietary fiber. I would recommend <laughs> this uh, so-called healthy diet. And there also might be probiotics. I'm not sure about antibiotics, but uh, 
it is yogurt and for healthy bacteria may be helpful, although data are lacking, and we are analyzing our own data on the intake of yogurt now. And um, actually, antibiotic, regarding antibiotics, long-term antibiotics used for respiratory infection, urinary tract infection, acne, rosacea, dental uh, reason, uh, it can increase the risk for colorectal adenoma we published uh, in gut. So I think the uh, uh, long-term antibiotic use maybe uh, disturb the gut microbiome, microbiota, and it can increase risk for uh, colorectal adenoma and cancer. So we like to get into uh, how they increase risk in a mechanistic uh, way. We have time. So now I, you know, continue on to uh, immuno MP theme. My next target is uh, this marine omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids, which is rich in fish oil, basically. So the fish oil or this marine omega-3 PUFA uh, has been associated with the correct uh, lower colorectal cancer risk, but uh, epidemiologic data are conflicting, not really conclusive. And then some experimental data suggest marine omega-3 fatty acid can inhibit regulatory T cells, and it can stimulate, affect the T cell. So what we are interested in is this uh, FOXP3 Treg, regulatory T cell. And the functionally, uh, it's very uh, in interesting group of uh, T cells and, and also study have been shown Fox P3 positive T reg are very heterogeneous and different functions. But nonetheless, so this is a kind of a simplified hypothesis, but uh, omega-3 fatty acid intake can suppress T reg, and then if T reg suppressed, then immune response can be stimulated and then eliminate if, uh, emerging tumor. So that's our very simplified hypothesis. So, uh, so this is a hypothesis in a, in a, in a cohort uh, scheme. I mean, we have exposure as a uh, omega-3 fatty acid as exposure, and our hypothesis is uh, this omega-3 fatty acid suppress the development of uh, colorectal cancer, which have more abundant FOXP3 Treg, but not the, uh, the other type. So we, we published this in also JAMA Oncology 2016, and so we separate uh, FOXP3 uh, positive cell high type so these have a uh, rich Treg cells in tumor tissue, and these are not. And then this x-axis is a marine omega-3 fatty acid intake. So low is virtually no fish, and then high is lots of fish and other sources supplement too. So actually you can really see that uh, cancer risk for this fox species High cell high type decreased by uh, intake of uh, omega-3 fatty acids substantially. However, Fox P cell, Fox P3 positive cell low type, and they are not the cancer risk are not uh, influenced by uh, omega-3 fatty acid. So it's it's quite interesting. Our data our our data from cohort studies actually back up this kind of a simple, simple hypothesis we made. So marine omega-3 fatty acid may suppress Treg function, regulatory T cell function, and then that can stimulate immune response to eliminate uh, emerging tumor cells. So, uh, I think that we have enough, we have shown example of uh, immuno-MPE 
and then microbial MPE. But uh, anyway, so this is uh, kind of uh, my own outstanding investigator award grant, seven year grant. Uh, theme two is we, I plan to expand the population science, you know, frontiers. So obviously, molecular pathological epidemiology, I, I proposed back in 2010, which is really growing with uh, international meeting series. Now we are going into other fields to collaborate and then getting more insights. So the one such example is I show this immuno MPE and also a microbial MPE I show example of a fusobacterium nucleatum. And also we have been already analyzing aspirin more than 10 years, but uh, uh, so this area can be named as a pharmaco MPE. It's a pharmacology m integrated with molecular pathology and epidemiology. So to analyze uh, drugs, especially common drugs used in populations, to examine the really uh, effect on the other diseases too. So people taking aspirin probably for prevention of a cardiovascular disease or pain, it can be a predicti uh, preventive against the cancer or other disease too. Or maybe causing some other disease. So we have to really uh, analyze big data set, population-based data on aspirin and then disease phenotype. So that's what uh, we are aiming and by, by naming this field as a pharma called MPE. And I also show example of nutritional MPE. And I mean, nutritional epidemiology has been around for decades, but now we are interested in looking into molecular pathology as well as uh, microbiota and the immunology. So actually, I, I put all four a separate way, but really we can actually consider these as whole thing as a new frontiers of uh, MPE. So those are in, in more like a pathobiological new frontiers uh, into uh, um, you know many different uh, directions, but also we are interested in uh, uh, developing statistical methods because uh, this molecular pathology idea of a tumor classification bring in lots of challenges in epidemiology. So mm, we are actively developing statistical method we, which we, I haven't discussed in this talk, but uh, if you are interested in, we published the representative paper in statistics in medicine 2016. And then another area is a causal inference, MPE. So the causal inference is a one subfield of epidemiology which developing mathematical algorithm to tease out observational data and then actually simulate observational data into trial data so that uh, you know, the, the you know, association can be free of confounding. So this uh, mathematical algorithm can be integrated into MPE to help uh, elucidate causality much better way. So we have you know, re recently we published a new uh, European Journal of Epidemiology using uh, inverse probability weighting. So that's uh, one direction. Also we have published uh, network science and MPE dataset integration, so forth. So really, uh, we are pushing uh, molecular pathological epidemiology into other setting and other exposures and also the method development. So that's the main focus of uh, my current my work. So uh, to summarize my talk, uh, molecular pathological epidemiology, MPE, can provide new insights, which uh, no, no other approach can. And MP is making new frontiers, such as pharmaco MPE, and immuno MPE, nutritional MPE, microbial MPE, 
and so forth. And complex drug environment cell interactions necessitate pharmacomp paradigm for a discovery and validation of new drug use. And then I would say uh, this immuno-MP model, I mean immuno-MP studies, uh, as I said, there are not many other groups are still uh, published paper. I'm, I know many other groups are actually working on now, <laughs> but uh, still kind of an open field and there are lots of opportunities for immuno-MP studies. And one reason is exposures can easily influence tumor microenvironment. The, re, uh, the example I showed is aspirin, omega-3 fatty acids, microbiota, and I didn't show, but I, we have a data in gen, on genetic variation as well as smoking as well. They really easily influence tumor cell, much easier than tumor genome, actually. So let's look at immune cells. So uh, I would like to acknowledge, uh, so many people uh, helped me or are involved in the big cohort studies and also uh, there are many collaborators and I cannot list everyone. Nonetheless, I would like to particularly thank uh, Dr. Charlie Fuchs, who is a, a head of uh, Yale Cancer Center, and Andy Chan at the Mass General Hospital and also Ed Giovannucci at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and then Walter Willett, Lorelei Mucci, uh, PIs of uh, health professionals for up study, and Mia Stamfer, Frank Grodstein is a PI of nurses health study. And also I'd like to thank Jonathan Nowak, Reiko Nishara as a colleague in the uh, pathology at the Brigham Women's Hospital. And also I would like to thank our nurses, health study, and health professional follow-up study uh, participants across the country and various hospitals and pathology departments for providing us uh, precious tissue materials. So these are the breakdown of uh, where the tissue come from and except uh, North Dakota and Alaska, we got the tissue from all other states. And then we'd like to thank funding and also uh, laboratory members. And thank you very much for your attention. 